Hi there, I'm Dr. Larry Chu. Um, welcome back to another uh, class called of um, Medical Education in the New Millennium. Uh, on behalf of my course co-directors, Kyle Harrison and Nikita Joshi, I want to welcome you to this class on cognition and learning. Uh, as you know, the way our class works, we always start out with a five-minute Ignite talk. Um, today, it's going to be from uh, Andrew Phillips. Andrew is a former high school, junior high school teacher turned emergency medicine resident at Kaiser and Stanford Emergency Medicine Program. Um, and he will be a critical care fellow here at Stanford next year. He attended the University of Chicago for medical school and completed a master's degree in education from the University of Illinois at Chicago while developing a new radiological anatomy curriculum as a medical student. So we're going to hear from Andrew, and then after Andrew, uh, of course, Dr. Dan Schwartz, uh, professor of education at Stanford, will be speaking. We will see you on the other side of this break. And for those of you watching on Twitter, we did see your comments last week, and the real Zoe Chu is here in person at this event. Okay, so we'll see you. We're going to go to a little break, and we'll see you in just a bit. Welcome to Medical Education in the New Millennium, a new course from the Stanford University School of Medicine. This interdisciplinary course is produced by Stanford Medicine X and features talks from thought leaders and innovators from medical education, instructional design, cognitive science, online learning, and emerging technology. Over the course of 11 weeks, we'll consider how to build educational experiences that address the unique learning preferences of today's millennial medical students and residents, address gaps in the current medical education system, and explore what might be accomplished when all healthcare stakeholders are included in the conversation. If you are joining us for the first time, a quick reminder that there is a simultaneous conversation happening on Twitter right now using the hashtag MedX. Christopher Snyder, otherwise known as I am Spartacus, is the in-class moderator for today's program and will be taking questions from social media. So please make sure to start up your Twitter client to join in the online conversation and interact with today's speakers. Please also make sure to like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX. Please note, you are watching a live online program and there is a delay between real-time events and the live stream you are watching. Tweets from our in-class guests will appear before you see the real-time events they are tweeting about unfold on the video live stream. Good evening. It's a pleasure to join you today. It was laundry day the other day and I had a lot of not quarters. Have you ever sat around and tried to figure out how you can possibly come up with exactly how much change you have when you have the giant bucket of coins, pennies, nickels, and everything? But what ends up happening? You end up putting all the pennies into like tens or fifteens, the quarters into a dollar, next thing you know you have multiple piles of coins throughout. So you can just look at it and you can say one dollar, two dollar, three fifty, or three fifty, seventy five, whatever it happens to be. The point of just walking through that is that that was an exercise in cognition, whether I realized it or not. I had to recognize that the quarters had some sort of value to them. If I couldn't see them or touch them, then I couldn't recognize that those quarters had any value to them. So cognition is limited first by the organism doing the initial part of the thinking, me or you as it were. Cognition is also composed of the external part, the outside. The quarters have an inherent value. Even if I didn't know they were worth 25 cents or the nickel's five, what have you, they still have that inherent value, totally separate from my ability to realize that. So that's the other part of it. The third part is I ended up moving those coins to the side. I interacted with my environment. I had to place my cognition into them and appreciate theirs in mine, and then I actually cognitive offloading. Now, the education folks in here may recognize these as some of the three main tenets for embodied cognition or situated cognition. Fully recognized, it's not a full learning theory, or at least recognized by everyone, but just give me a little slack since I've got just a few minutes. So we'll go with that, embodied cognition. So we have three things here. You, your external environment, and your interaction with that, which can include some cognitive offloading. So you may be asking yourself, explain to me, please, how a bunch of quarters, nickels, and dimes, and a few pennies have anything to do with Twitter, the cloud, and technology in our education, especially in medicine. 
glad you asked the question. So we talked about how we create these experiences, right? Interact with your environment. The experience becomes something you learn. The way you interact with what you learn is by making cues. If I say boy, you say girl. OK, it's a cue. It's developed. Whereas the information outside of us hasn't changed all that much, more rapid now, but nonetheless, diabetes is diabetes, hypertension is hypertension. The format with which we're hearing this has changed. The FOMED movement you heard about last week, multiple other avenues of this. It's our interaction with them that's changed. 20 years ago, you couldn't just pull out your smartphone and look up a disease that you didn't know. You had to go back and find Harrison's. So our interaction with this information is what has changed. It's a deluge. You've heard maybe the example that learning medicine is like drinking from a fire hose. Well, now it's probably like drinking from five fire hoses. So what do you do with that? The point is that you have to mind your cues. And if you have more interest in kind of the cognitive side of things, you can use also more technology and a QR code up there and to follow this link to a really good handbook and read through it. The point is that with all this deluge of information, you may not be able to control the environment, the cognition outside of you, but you can control to some extent your interactions, and you absolutely can control your cues. So for example, next time you do laundry and kick out all the coins, think about the fact that you're in control of the cues. You can remember and put things together. For example, if I said doc, uh, AAA to Dr. Schwartz, he would say that stands for the awesomely adaptive and advanced learning and behavior. But if I said that to Dr. Chu, he would probably say abdominal aortic aneurysm. And if I said it to my wife back in the corner, she would probably say cheaper hotels. So you can make your cues whatever you want them to be. I hope you had a good walk over here. It so happens that by doing so, made you think a little more creatively. I'll let you talk to this gentleman afterwards about any questions you have about that one from his most recent paper. But it is at this time my esteemed pleasure to introduce to you the Nomalini Olivier Chair for Education and Technology, Dr. Daniel Schwartz. In 2015, Medicine X will be launching a new program called Medicine X Ed. This special conference, right before Medicine X 2015, will focus on medical education and what might be accomplished when all healthcare stakeholders can engage in a conversation about changing the culture of medicine through educational innovation. Of course, we'll discuss the role technology can play in medical education, but we'll also look at gaps in our current educational system, such as participatory medicine, shared decision making, patient engagement, cost transparency, patient safety and reducing harm, and cross-cultural competencies. What other gaps might we address at MedicineX Ed? Let us know what you think by tweeting our hashtag MedX. And make sure to sign up online to learn more about MedicineX Ed and how you can get involved. work on uh, how, how to help people get new ideas. And so this could be creativity or learning something very difficult. Uh, and so we do a lot of work in cognition and learning. And cognition is usually described as the study of intelligent behavior. But I'm not going to talk about that. I, I have talked to medical groups before. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of people about how people should learn and how you should teach them. And I always hit the same choke point where great ideas, people nod, and nothing happens. And so instead, I'm going to talk about the least fun part of education, which is tests. Except for some of you who probably did great on tests, and that's why you're here and you love them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about tests, because I think they're preventing us from doing some interesting things in education and in instruction. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can make them better with computers. So here's the outline. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, problems with current tests. And, uh, and the reason I want to talk about them, again, is that uh, you can't change the learning until you change the tests. Right? So, so the, the MCAT is finally changing because of this problem. They started to realize that the MCAT was 
sort of selecting and leading to certain kinds of learning and instruction that isn't actually what they wanted for doctors. And so they finally started to change that. So these, these tests are very important. They, they influence what people think matters the most. Right? So they shape national and local policy. Uh, they shape instruction and teacher practices. And they shape what students think counts as useful learning. And, and so there's sort of this, this little thing in the background that we don't pay attention to because we don't actually know who makes the tests. They just show up, but they do a lot, a lot to shape us. And so current tests send the wrong message about what counts as useful learning. So I need to prove this to you, so I, I will do so. Uh, here is a, um, this is a California standard for US history 11th grade. So very thoughtful people put together standards for what students should learn. And somewhere along the line, these standards get sort of farmed out to assessment makers, and they make test items. And those test items determine lots of stuff. So here's the standard. Uh, I will let you read this. So this is good standard. If people knew this, this would be quite satisfying. So your task is to predict the question that kids see for this standard. You, you'll never do it, so I, I, won't, I won't, I won't. So down at the bottom is the standard. Here's, half, here's part of the question, right? And then here's the question they have to answer. So some, somehow, they sort of lost the intent of the standard. So just to drive it home a little more, uh, you have to predict the standard. I'll give you the test item. So here's which of these organisms would most likely be found at the top of the energy pyramid. I, I don't know why I always have an urge to say clams. But that, that is not, <laughs> I believe that is not correct. So your task is to decide what does the standard look like. And so there it is at the bottom, and here's the standard. So the standards are well intended. They capture important things. And then the assessments are something completely different. Right? And so the, the first issue here is that most tests measure a thin slice of learning outcomes that we might care about. So if, if we ignore the absurdity of those items, because I pick really absurd items, uh, there's familiar issues with tests like this. There's this overemphasis over on unaided retrieval of facts and skills. It's just you, your pencil, and the bubble that you fill in, or you, the computer terminal, and you just have to remember stuff. That's sort of the task. And uh, so this, this is uh, a way to emphasize routine efficiency. You're, you're supposed to be fast. You're supposed to be efficient. You have low variability. That's what most tests measure, like the SAT. That's what that is, right? And you, you get it right. Uh, and this, this is sort of why people make mistakes as well. So uh, these kinds of tests are useful uh, for when you are going to go into highly stable performance environments where you know exactly what it's going to be and efficiency always works. So for example, word decoding. Uh, we practice word decoding in very stable environments because the words are always left to right. There's always spaces between them, whether it's on my cell phone, a poster, a paper. So you want people to be fast. You don't want them to be figuring it out each time. Uh, another example of a highly stable environment is a gymnasts. And, and so they practice to a high degree of efficiency on very stable equipment. I don't know if any of you saw the Olympics, the Summer Olympics, a few years back. But there's this period where all the women were wiping out on the vault, right? They had developed this high degree of efficiency for a very specific environment. And the vault turned out to be someone set it a half inch too low. And they're just all wiping out, right? So high efficiency is good, not if the environment changes. This is where you start to get blinded by your assumptions. You start to believe things, and you don't see what's new. And so this is relevant to the opening task you did. So what we probably care about more is adaptability. People to let go of their assumptions, to learn new things, to continue growing, and to change. Some things you want high efficiency, but there's not a lot of them. So let me give a thought experiment where the usual tests might lead to a misdiagnosis. Uh, so I have two candidates applying for a job. I have Bob, who took a five-week course in Excel spreadsheet software. And I have Mike, who does not know Excel, but he taught himself three other spreadsheet programs. The company uses Excel. 
So they give a test on Excel. And he sits down with Excel. And the result, as you would expect, would be Bob would do better because sort of Bob learned the exact commands that you're supposed to use in Excel. But that's probably not who you want to hire, right? Because six months later, Mike is going to be the one who's going to do the best because he already shows that he can continue learning, adapting, he understands the principles of spreadsheets. So this is kind of a general story that these aptitude tests, they predict about 9% of job performance immediately after training and then it drops to 4% and then it completely disappears. Right? So something about our tests aren't actually capturing what matters the most. Let me, let me give you one more example uh, before I give you an alternative model for assessment. So you may have seen this. Uh, every, every couple of years there's some reporters who like see Harvard students at a graduation or Stanford, you know, and they're a little tipsy maybe and they got their mortar board and they say, so Mr. Graduate, uh, so why do the seasons change? And the Harvard student says something like, well, because the Earth's closer to the sun or because it's cloudy, is that why? And the reporter, quite smug about the whole thing, sort of implies that a Harvard education is no better than a high school diploma, right? Well, that's sort of what our tests are like. How do you fix that? Well, you give them, give them a data learning answer. Who's going to do better, right? Suddenly, you're going to see all the things that the Harvard student can bring to bear, all the education that they've had that has prepared them. So this other kind of assessment is a dynamic assessment. And the idea is, as part of the test, you give people a chance to learn during the test. And you see, can they learn what you're giving them right then and there? And so this turns out to be a very sensitive kind of measure. So this is an alternative to the usual kind of test. OK, so the second issue is that people use tests to define what counts as useful learning. Uh, one is, uh, the tests are a bad measure. The second is people use those measures to decide what they think is important. And so they send the wrong message to students about useful learning. You know, as a teacher, I can tell the students, you know, you got to stick with it, try lots of different things, be exploratory, be creative. But then the test comes back, and that trumps whatever I may have told them, because that is the evidence of what I consider most important. And students would be stupid not to pay attention to the grades on the test, because that is the evidence that's available to them. So uh, instructional formats then start to follow the tests. And this is sort of the problem I'm worried about most, is you, know, that, uh, you get a certain kind of test in organic chemistry, and what's the instruction look like? It's preparing you for that test. So uh, we took over a section in physics here at Stanford, and we taught them in a new way that actually led to much better outcomes, and we know this. And the, the student response was, the problems you're giving us are not the problems that are going to show up on the test. I don't want to do these. I want to do the word problems like they look on the test. Right? Of course. They'd be, they'd be stupid not to do that. So here's an interesting graph. Uh, this is from the TIMS. This is an international study that gives the same test to lots and lots of nations to see so we can rank ourselves, because people like to do that. Right? And over here, uh, what we're doing is we're plotting the average science score. So uh, everybody likes to know, here's the United States. So we're at about 550. And uh, so the interesting thing about this graph is this other axis. This is the percent of students in the country who have a positive attitude towards science. So the better your nation is doing on this test, the less you like science. Right? And that's a pretty good correlation. And so I think there's a lot of interpretations that you might have of this, but the one I like is the reason these students are doing the best on this test is because they're pre being prepared for that test. They see what that's like, and they don't like it. That's not what they want to do, right? They want to be scientists. So I think something about preparing people for these tests gives them a bad idea of what it is they're supposed to be, what it really would be like. OK, so here's the, here's the, you know, the world's falling apart. Now, income computers. So what, what can we do with computers to help fix this? Well, uh, option one is we can measure the wrong thing only faster and at scale. <laughs> right? uh, so a good example of this is uh, adaptive testing. Adaptive testing may not be what you think it is. It's basically a way for the test to find out sort of where you rank on 100 points faster. So you're taking this test, and if you get the answer right, it'll give you a harder one. You get the answer wrong. Uh, you may, if you've ever done this, you may have had this kind of response to it. 
you know, it just gave you an easier problem. You know you just got the last one wrong, right? And the test is trying to calibrate to where you are. Right? Uh, so one of my favorite psychometricians, these are people who study how you make uh, the mathematics of good tests, uh, has this to say. And uh, I'm assuming everybody can read this. Uh, and so I don't need to read it out loud. But if that's wrong, let me know. So the important part of this is that uh, computerized testing is a mechanical horse. It's testing, you know, all it's doing is it's going faster a little and it's a lot more expensive. Right, so it's basically, uh, if I were to take a cheap shot at MOOCs, it's sort of doing what MOOCs are doing. Oh look, we can get the worst kind of instruction known to man to go to scale. Excellent. Not this MOOC, Margie. Okay, so option two is to use computers to gather what was impossible before, but matters a lot. So what matters a lot? So I, I talk with a lot of school principals and superintendents, and I sort of tell them what I am. And uh, I ask them what I can do for them, and I, I used to think they would tell me, can you help our kids do better on the standardized tests? Because there's a lot riding on that, like uh, forming, uh, funding formulas. And their answer is always the same. It is, can you help our students be more adaptive and make good choices as they go through and continue to learn in life. And it's a very consistent theme. And you also sort of see this in these new 21st century competencies that are showing up. You know, things like grit, persistence, uh, collaboration, uh, or in informal learning, autonomous, when nobody's telling you what to do, right? The, sort of, the main concern in all these is that people are making the right choices to do. Should I stick with it? Should I quit? Right? Am I choosing the right things to work on? So given this, it seems to me what matters is choices that improve learning. And this is what we should be assessing, are the kinds of choices people make about their learning. And so computers are kind of key for this because uh, they can create this rich interactive learning environment so I can see do people learn? Are they prepared to learn? And do they make the right choices to do that? And computers collect lots of data. So I get all the data on the backside. So here's what we've been doing about it. Uh, we're making these little game-based assessments that measure student choices. And they're uh, 10 to 15 minute games called choicelets. And they capture typical performance, not maximal performance. So most tests are capturing you at your very strongest effort. And what I really want to know is, no, what do you like most of the time when you're doing your learning, not when you're all you know, geared up for a test? And so there's things to learn in these games, but you don't have to. You can level up without learning them. And so it's sort of there for you. And we can sort of see, are you prepared to learn by making the right choices about these kinds of resources to learn about? And so we, make, we track their choices. And uh, ideally, we can demonstrate that some choices are better for learning, that we can demonstrate these choices can be measured. And finally, we can test whether we can teach students to make better choices about their learning. So let me give you an example of one. This is called Posterlet. Uh, you are the, on the organizing committee for the school fun fair, and your job is to make posters for booths. And so the first thing you do is you choose a booth. You then design your poster. There is then a focus group who looks at your poster. You get to choose three people from that, three animals from the focus group, and you get to choose uh, Feedback that either says, I don't like, or feedback that says, I like. But you can only choose one of the two for each character. Uh, you read your feedback. If you'd like to revise, you can. Then you submit your poster, and uh, you get to see how many tickets you sold, and you do this two more times. So let me, let me show this concretely. I don't quite know how to make my mouse show up, but maybe you can. Yeah, thank you. So this is me, I've chosen the basketball toss, and I'm gonna make a very bad poster. Everybody chooses the lion. So now you see it says, I don't like or I like, and I get to choose one. 
And the information I get from I don't like and I like is equally informative. Uh, and I chose not to revise. I submit my poster. I sold one ticket. Uh, and now I can make two more posters. So the key moment in this game is do they choose I don't like or I like for the feedback? Right, this is the critical choice. And this is what we're measuring. So uh, there's three posters total. There's nine chances to choose positive or negative feedback. And I get three chances to revise. Each poster I can revise just once. Uh, all the feedback's informative. So we wrote a little intelligence system that looks at the posters and evaluates them by 21 graphic design principles. We're not measuring artistic quality. It's things like, can I read your text? Right? Do you have a picture in there? And so there's the positive feedback, which says things like, good, your font is big enough to read. And there's the negative feedback that says, it's hard to read the small letters. So uh, negative here means constructive. It doesn't mean punishment. But the liter it's, so the literature indicates that negative feedback is better for learning. Uh, but nobody likes it, right? Because they take the negative feedback as an ego threat. It's, it's about me, as opposed to being about their poster. And so that's, that's kind of a problem that people have. And so uh, we wanted to see, does seeking negative feedback tell us anything important? Right? Which may be difficult for some people to do. And, and all the prior work on feedback has imposed it. It's called supervised, supervised learning, where someone else is giving you feedback. Here, we're, it's up to them what they want to choose. So uh, is choosing negative feedback important? Uh, we asked 450 middle school kids to play. And the major goal of this first study is just to validate the assessment. So for these choice-based assessments, we run into this tough problem, which is that with most tests, accuracy is objective. So if you give the answer five, I know you're wrong. Right? If you give it four, it's you're right. But when I say you know, choosing negative feedback is right, you might argue with me and say, you can't prove that. Right? So I have to go out and prove that certain choices are better than others. So that's what we did here. We, went to demonstrate that some choices are better than others. And so is choosing negative feedback the right choice for learning? So what we have here is uh, the results. So negative feedback, again, they got nine chances to choose between positive and negative feedback. So the more negative feedback they choose, the less positive they're getting. Right? They only get nine. So we can look at their, the, how much their posters improve over time. And it turns out the more negative feedback you choose, the more your poster increases. So this number is called a correlation. And it basically, a big number means two things are really tightly associated. And a really small number means they're not. Right? So this is a pretty good association for this. Uh, we also give them a post test afterwards about graphic design principles. Like uh, don't, don't put the text too close to the edge, which is one of the things the game's taught. And we see again, uh, oops, sorry. Here you see revision also improved poster quality. This makes sense because they're making a better poster by revising it. Uh, on the post test of the graphic design principles, again, we see negative feedback correlates. We see revision goes down, but it's still correlating. So basically, these two things, if you engage in this, it predicts that you will learn more from this game. Turns out negative feedback and revision are correlated. So, you know, is it that kids who like negative feedback are also kids who like revision? Or is the negative feedback triggers revision? Eh, I don't know. So here's the second part. The choice of negative feedback in the game correlates with learning in school. So we have a sample, a uh, subsample of these kids. We got their achievement tests. So in New York, they have their own test and their own standards. And the negative feedback is correlating pretty well with it. So this little game is predicting 16% uh, of the variance in kids' math scores in New York, if that makes sense to you. Chicago uses a different set of standards and a different test. But those kids, uh, they show the same level of correlation. So this choice to seek negative feedback seems to be important. Revision, not so much. It bounces around, right? So it's, it's kind of less reliable. So, so the take home here is stated another way, the more that you seek positive feedback, the, wet, the less you're going to learn in the game and in school. So you can't, you're not going to find that out another way than this.
So summary, choosing more negative feedback is better for learning within the game and it's associated with academic achievement. There's a bunch of issues. Maybe there's something deeper that causes the correlation between negative feedback and learning. You know, maybe, maybe it's personality, it's IQ, you know, same things are there. Maybe it's something you can't change and so these are issues that we need to go study. But my, my view of this is that learning choices are strategies. And, and a lot of the things that you think are personality traits are actually strategies. Uh, so we have this tendency to view broad-based cognitive skills as traits, like IQ. We tend to think of IQ as a property of a person. IQ is a score you got on a test. That's all it is. It's like, it's like me saying you got a 23 on a spelling test. But IQ suddenly it becomes the person, right? So take, take the example of a creative person. You think some people are creative, some are not. You may even go to like the D school here and get trained in how to be creative and you may think, I am a more creative person. That's the wrong attribution, right? Really what you've done is you've learned a set of strategies that help you become more creative. So walking, we've shown that walking improves your creativity almost twofold. Uh, we did another study where if you have people generate ideas in parallel, they're much more creative, they get more clicks on the web, everything's good. You know, another thing is you should treat tasks as low stakes. If they're high stakes, you won't be creative because you're too worried and you want to take the safe route. So creativity is a choice. It's a choice to use these strategies. It's not a trait, right? And so I think that's true for things like choosing negative feedback, for being adaptive, and so forth. So we assume that learning choices are also strategies and they can be taught. So we conducted a study to find out. So hang on, this one's complicated. So this is the way it worked. This was like the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, we took over a middle school, sixth grade, and taught 12 classes for four weeks. And what we did is we did sort of design thinking, because it sort of it's, it goes after these dispositions, fail early, fail often kinds of stuff. And uh, everybody went through these, these simplified design cycles. And so the first one was uh, two weeks in math. And they made like design pig houses and nets. I don't know why pig houses, but that's what they wanted. Nets, I understand, this is where you sort of, uh, you make sort of cutouts and then they fold up into a box. So that made sense to me. Then we did uh, one week in social studies where we designed a unit where they had to design a fair way to make decisions, a process for making decisions. Sort of perfect for sixth graders. Uh, and then finally, uh, we had them make an ecosystem board game that the board game had to show that organisms sort of, dis you lose energy as things move up the food chain. And so there were two groups. We split these 12 into two sets of six classes. And so one got parallel design. And what they were told is you try many things and look across them. So if you're making these nets like this, you make a bunch of them and then you sort of look through and see what's working and what's not. So it's a very design thinking strategy. And across these different things, they got to do this five times. So out of four weeks, we actually only got about an hour and a half of getting our treatment in. Right? It's the price for doing business with schools. The other condition was stakeholder design. Here, their job was to go get social feedback. Right? And to make their net, their instructions for how to make the net, and they would give it to somebody else. And then they would see how the other person used it, and the other person would give them feedback on how they're doing. And then after, and so they got that five times. So everything's exactly the same except for these five time points. Then afterwards, we give them two assessments. One is the one I just showed you about seeking negative feedback, and one is called Photolit, and I need to show that to you briefly. So in Photolit, you are a cub reporter, and the animals have escaped from the zoo, and they've gone to all sorts of ironic places, like there's porcupines at the balloon shop. And your job is to go take photos of them. And uh, you take photos and you have these settings. Like you can set the focus, the shutter speed, the aperture, things like that. Uh, you can get some resources to how these things work if you want. You can take all your photos and sort through them and sort of see what's working. Uh, then you submit your photo, you get feedback, and then you do it again. So here's a quick video of what this looks like. So these are sort of the different tabs that you have. So these are monkeys in the convenience store. Your task is take photos, a photo of the monkeys fighting for the banana. 
So it's kind of blurry, so maybe you change the lens setting. And you've taken some photos and you can take uh, as many as you want and you go to this page and you can sort of look at your photos close up and uh, you can sort them. You can sort them by hand like this. Uh, or there's a drop down that allows you to sort them by which one has the best focus or when was, how was the lens set. Uh, here's the animation. Uh, so this sort of is trying to teach them a little bit about how the camera works. We ran out of time. There was supposed to be some text on the side to sort of explain what's going on, uh, but we didn't have time to do it. So I don't know what, how much people learned. Uh, you then choo choose your photo, you submit it, and uh, Chuckles gives you five bananas. He likes the, that the focus is on the right target. And then uh, you go on and you do this for several rounds. And so the first round, you've got monkeys at the convenience store. Second round, you've got penguins serving drinks to polar bears. And in this round, you now, your camera has a shutter speed. So you can control that along with focus. The next round, there's rhinoceroses in the china shop. And here you get to control the f-stop. And then uh, finally, you have all three controls for the porcupines. Okay, So both kids take both of these. right? The prediction would be, you would think, the people who did the stakeholder design are the ones that we taught go get social feedback. So we expect them to get more negative, choose more negative feedback in the poster lit one. These kids were taught parallel designs, try many things, look across them. So we would expect them to sort of do better on this, where they would try more settings, take more photos with different kinds of settings. So that, that's the prediction. And so there's one last thing to note this school tracks math. So there's the double advanced math, there's the advanced math, and then there's the regular math. And uh, if you're in advanced math, you stay with those kids through social studies, through science, just because of the difficulties of schedule. Okay, get ready. So remember, stakeholder condition, seek feedback, parallel condition, make lots and examine. So here are the postulate results. These are the kids in the parallel condition. So we didn't teach them to seek feedback. What you can see is that the regular math students choose negative feedback about three times, and the double advanced choose negative feedback about six times. So this is the same kind of result as I showed you before. In fact, the correlation here about how much they choose negative feedback and their standardized California tests are about the same level as you saw earlier when I talked about New York and Chicago. So this just replicates what I've shown you before. Now the other condition, they're the ones we taught to seek negative feedback. And the question is, what's going to happen? So it looks like this. That it is the low achieving kids who learned it. The high achieving kids already had it. So now we can cross over to the photo let. So here, I'm representing how many different camera settings did they try. So in this case, the kids who were told to seek feedback are now the control condition, right? Because we never taught them to sort and try lots of things. So again, choosing lots of camera setting is correlating with standardized achievement tests. And you can see it just by how it's laying out with the grades. Question is, the kids we taught to seek lots of stuff, what do you do You know, to try things out? Did we have an effect on them? Same story, right? We move the low achieving kids, right? So I'll, I'll leave this up for a second. It's a lot of data points to digest. So interpretations, the simplest is we can measure these choices. Uh, the computer made it fun for the kids, a lot of work for us. But that made it tractable for us because we could collect this data. Right? We couldn't do it in another way. Uh, the choices appear to matter for learning and they can be taught. And there seems to be a reason to teach the choices. And now there's a way to know if we're succeeding. So you hear a lot about teach design thinking, but they have no way of finding out is that good or not. Now we do. And you have a way to compare different curriculum. Uh, so there's the irony of the high achiever result. So when, when you go into these schools, 
uh, the teachers all say the same thing. They say, these high achieving kids, they're the ones who need to learn these new kinds of design thinking skills because they're so worried about getting the right answer on the test. They don't want to get wrong. Turns out they know. They know to try lots of stuff. They know to seek negative feedback. The problem is it's the environment they're in. Right? They'd be stupid to do that when getting the right answer is how they got there. So they already know these skills. And the problem isn't with the kids. The problem is with the classrooms. Then there's this other question, which is why don't the low achievers know or use these strategies? So I'm, I'm guessing you can generate a lot of interesting hypotheses. Uh, I won't bother. A uh, good question, though, is now that we've taught these low achievers to do better, will their standardized achievement tests go up? Be sort of a miracle result, but I'm hopeful. So we've made some other of these. Choice to organize information. This one would be good for you know, doctors on the way. Basically, you have to replace the vet and diagnose dogs who come in. And we look to see, do you bother to organize your information, or do you just flip through prior patients? Turns out this is a really good predictor. Uh, choice to engage in critical thinking. So people often get confused about critical thinking. Uh, critical thinking is how do you decide what to believe? Most tests are hypothetical, deductive, sort of like you'd imagine the LSAT is. But in here, what we did is we just measured, are you willing to engage in critical thinking? Turns out that's a really good predictor of how people are doing in school. Choice to abandon after failure. If you fail, do you choose to do something else or do you stick with it? So this is pretty typical kind of persistence measure. Uh, choice to inquire or do you just want to get the right answer? Choice to read. These are fun to make. So in conclusion, uh, teaching of the test. Uh, why do people consider this to be a bad thing? Uh, one reason is because I might only teach a small sample of the material that I can cover on the test. Right, because the test can only be so long, so I just sample stuff that I've taught. If I talk to the test, I might only teach that sample of stuff. So that's one honest complaint about it. Another one is we appreciate the tests don't measure what we really care about. Right? And so, uh, but what, what if the test asks people to learn something new during the test when given a set of resources and cho choices for how to use them? If we just change our test format. Uh, we would probably, as teachers, teach the students the most important concepts plus the strategies that prepare them to learn. We wouldn't teach them all the edge cases and all the tiny things because they can look that up. Right? In this case, teaching the test could be a good thing. So, thank you. No, I don't have anything. I don't. up the floor. Uh, actually, well, you're the one to answer the questions. Also, no, places no, with no. If they may want to ask about cues, <laughs> uh, to open up the floor to questions, for Dr. Schwartz. Yes, sir. Uh, so I find it really, I find it really interesting that, uh, like, for kind of facts or materials that negative feedback or skills like that are pretty concrete, that negative feedback is really effective. Uh, but it kind of runs contra contrary to what I've heard about like adults and changing behavior. Uh, for example, in the D school, we were taught a framework for giving feedback of tell someone what they've done in the past, tell them what they did well, don't tell them what they did wrong, and then tell them what they should do better in the future. And I know like a management consulting firm, McKinsey, they have a similar strengths-based feedback model. So what, why are adults seeing that? And we, it seems to suggest the opposite for kids. No. No, it's the same result for adults and kids. Uh, so a lot of times people sort of say, give feedback with sort of um, a star and a wish, right? Uh, so there's another name for this that starts with a swear word. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, but the, idea, the problem is negative feedback actually is informative. And so it, it is the signal that you should adapt. And it gives you, if it's good negative feedback, gives you an indication of how you should adapt, in what direction. The problem is, and so praise turns out to be very ineffective for changing learning. What praise does is it has these two effects. One is it lets you believe you've learned enough so you can stop. Or it makes you really like the task and you'll keep doing the exact same thing. Right? The reason they put in praise is to buffer people from the interpretation of negative feedback as a criticism of their ego. 
So the reason I say, that was a great question, but you know, you sort of asked the wrong thing. The great question part is to sort of prevent you from feeling too beat up by the negative feedback. Right, so the positive feedback isn't really informative, it's not helping you learn, but it is protecting your ego. And, and we, I, I, of all people, like that the most. So. Thank you for your question. I'll take a moment and go to one of the Twitter questions from Courage Sings. They asked Dr. Schwartz if you have found in your research any relationship to learning styles. I know there's some controversy about learning styles and which one is uh, more demonstrated and if they are out there. Yeah, so learning styles uh, it is, is a little star-crossed. Um, there, there's not much empirical literature that supports the idea uh, that, so let's say you're a visual thinker. You claim you're a visual thinker, which probably means you just don't like to read, right? But, <laughs> but you say you're a visual thinker. The question is, should I therefore give you visual material to learn from, verbal material, kinesthetic, right? And so far, there's no evidence that sort of says, gee, if you're a visual thinker, I should give you visual material instead of verbal. You can imagine why. Most of our concepts, right, are pretty complicated, and they involve visual, verbal, all this stuff commingled. So, so the evidence on that. Now, people do have preferences, and so you might want to sort of say, oh, you like visual stuff? Here's some visual stuff. And that might make them more eager to learn, but the evidence that it's going to help them learn it isn't there as far as I've seen it. Or if it's there, it must be very rare. I'll piggyback to that question. And when you were speaking of the students with the lower standardized scores and showing that your uh, interventions helped them do better, it had a better increase in the students with the higher scores, were the students with the lower scores those with demonstrated learning disabilities? For example, uh, someone with dyslexia, maybe hearing things, they would respond better than having to read through them. Yeah, I mean, if you can't read, then reading's a bad way to teach you. Uh, for this study, no, you know, there, there, there are a lot of kids. It's, you know, the lower track is like 90 kids. It's, they're not, they don't all have disabilities. They're just, for whatever reason, you know, they just didn't, they weren't fans of math. Uh, but yeah, so when you, when you talk about people with clinical difficulties, you know, the game kind of changes. So like neuroscience is very good for people with clinical difficulties and tracking, tracking it down. Oftentimes, the training regimens that come out of that are sort of too grueling for normal people, right? And so the disability space is sort of different than, than the average space. But yeah, the learning style is interesting. I mean, people really like it. They like the idea, and, and I'd, I'd be happy to see evidence that supports it, but, but it's just, it's not there. It, but I don't, why everybody likes it, I don't know. But. Okay, we'll uh, start with the front row. So I went to a Montessori elementary school, which I'm not sure if everyone's familiar, but we don't receive grades. It's like you receive your test scores back, um, and you're supposed to correct it till you get things right, but you're not assigned A, B, C, D. And I think that really helped me just to learn for the enjoyment of learning. But then when you get to you know, middle school, high school, college, everything that you're doing is so, all the negative feedback you're receiving is in the form of like a bad letter grade. So what do you think are like the best ways to cope with the negative feedback you're receiving sort of defining you in terms of a letter grade? Yeah, yeah. So, so the letter grades are tough, too, because they're implicitly norm referenced, which means you're being ranked against other people. Mm -hmm. Like the law school really does this, right? The, everything's norm referenced. And, what you, what you, and so it's hard to not view the grade as a reflection of your whole being, because it's like you're lower than that person. What you really want are like criterion reference that say this is the thing you're supposed to know and if everybody gets it, you're all winners. Like the driving test is criterion reference. Fortunately, we don't do that or if we do, it, it all gets cluttered. So the best thing to do is to remember that the feedback, is, the feedback you get is about the task. It's not about you. It's about your performance on this task and the assumption that I could do the task better if I tried. Hard, hard to stop all that prattling. So there's a lot of things that people do. So there's a great study that came out recently where uh, there were two versions of feedback, and in one version it said, the teacher wrote, I have high standards, and I know I can hold you to them because you can do it. The other one said, I'm providing this feedback for your benefit. And you can guess which one worked better, right? It's the one that says the feedback is helping you, can do. But yeah, it's sort of on your shoulders. Because what happens? Yeah, the assessment system drives everything. So you got, you got to stand up against the winds. Oh, there were two hands behind you. Would you mind just passing the mic? 
that was a superb talk, uh, <coughs> Professor Swartz. Uh, I wonder, <coughs> in this experiment of uh, learning and assessment, uh, are there points that you could extract on the uni unilateral learning versus collaborative peer-to-peer multilateral learning, like getting feed feedbacks from uh, their peers? Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably not from this, but I, but I can talk to the point. So um, in peer tutoring and collaborative learning always shows better results, even for the high achieving kids. You know, the, the teachers and the peer tutoring, they learn more by teaching. So people learn a lot by teaching. Uh, you kind of have to teach people how to collaborate. So one of the challenges of all middle school teachers is to figure out how to get kids to give feedback. Because they're either, they don't want to say anything wrong or they flame, right? And so they spend a lot of time. So, so you sort of want to help, help people do that. If you have mixed age, it works pretty well because the younger look up to the older and the older sort of provide guidance. And so there's, it's sort of an expected relationship. And so that can work better. But yeah, to help people give good feedback is, is something that would be a good thing to teach and to assess. I, I, I'm sure all of you have had some professor in your life where you wish they had taken a course on delivering good feedback. Right? Or you've had collaborators who Sort of no matter what you say, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is but. And so, you know, it, it'd be good to teach people how to do this and to assess. So it's a good idea. Okay. Got another question on the right? I just sure. want to quickly piggyback off the like letter grade idea. Like because it seems like when we're talking about feedback, that you you were using the word like um like constructive and things like this when you're when you when people were choosing the, the negative route. Yeah. But the, the idea of getting like an A seems even less useful because you don't necessarily know what you did right. Yeah. Like, and, and you can have, frankly, people who maybe wouldn't continue to learn better or be adaptive, yeah. like completely hide within, let's say, like a 4.0 GPA, and you'd have yeah. no idea. Yeah. And, and but then I, my question was, uh, you know, thinking about this in reference to like medical education, because it's not just med school, right? Like doctors will get out and then they have to keep like learning the entire time. Yeah. And I'm wondering like what, what, are, what, what is the sort of structure and, and uh, validation mechanism for like continued education in a, in a very like authoritative profession like, like medicine? Yeah, that's a good question. You sort of like to change it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I, you guys I'm sure are amazing, but it's not obvious to me that the medical profession is selecting for the right people nor training them the way I would like them to be trained. That's a big thing to change. Changing the MCATs is a nice little start. Could you right. talk about, I mean, I don't know if anyone else is interested, but I, I don't know like how the MCAT is changing. So I was uh, nobody's like, seen the items yet. Okay. Uh, but, but basically it's gonna have more of a problem solving focus, less of a retrieval focus, which is good. I, I would like them to add, have people learn during the test, sort of like that, you know, to see are you really getting someone who's gonna learn well and be adaptive. Uh, you know, clinical, clinical psychology is interesting. So they, they're in a worse situation than, and than medical doctors. So uh, psychological services help, but there are no experts. So people who have been doing it for a long time are no better than people who have only been doing it for a while. And the problem is they don't get any feedback, right? They, there are, they don't get any sort of reliable data back, objective measures of patient outcomes. And what, what do we all want to do? We all want to see success. I mean, if, you, if I asked all of you to rate yourself, you would all rate yourself as an A or a B. Nobody would rate themselves as a C, right? And so that's what they do, and they see the success. You guys presumably have things in place that provide feedback about performance that allows you to realize when you've made successes, like after action reviews and things like that. Might be ways to bring feedback into the system. Looks like there were questions. All right, as we pass the mic um, to the back, now I saw there was one on the left here. Uh, would you take a moment and also uh, discuss with us the difference between summative and formative feedback? And it sounds yeah. like your work is kind of making a combination. I think it's a distinction. The yeah, there's that, a, there, it's a good question. There's a lot of different types of feedback. So high stakes feedback, high, high stakes tests do not bring feedback to the learners, right? They are for decision making by policymakers. So the high stakes tests, the information that comes back from those tests, you get it a year later. So it's not really feedback to the learner. They tend to be summative. Summative is sort of, at the end, let's see how good you are, right? And, and so your end of course tests are summative. There's another kind of assessment that's formative that's supposed to inform the kind of instruction that you're delivering. 
So I'm giving a class and I, I give the students some assignment and I see everybody's botching it. Then I realize, oh, I've got to change my teaching. And so that would be a formative assessment. Right. And then what I was proposing was sort of a dynamic assessment, which is give them a chance to learn and see what they learn, which I could use for formative or summative. So it's kind of a, you need some sort of complicated Venn diagram. Thank you, sir. There was a question in the back. Um, there's this whole theory that um, positive reinforcement in parenting leads to more successful kids, smarter, more intelligent. Um, going back to your study, you saw that the higher placed math kids didn't really benefit as much from negative feedback as the non-advanced placed math kids. Have you considered going retrospectively to see whether those kind of correlate to what kind of parenting they had um, early on? Because parenting, as, as we know, um, really contributes a lot to how kids succeed, right? Sure. In school, yeah, yeah, absolutely. not only in medicine, but you know, all the yeah, way from yeah. the beginning, yeah. elementary school. So just a small correction. The high achieving kids are seeking more negative feedback and as a consequence they are learning more. Okay. That's the result. It's not that they're shying away from it. So do you think maybe they're primed to seek negative feedback? Yeah, so this, on, this is a great yeah. question. So I'm, I'm going to tell a story of a colleague of mine when I saw this. So I sort of said to her, oh, the irony that, uh, that you know, the high achieving kids already know all this stuff. And the argument is usually coming from the high achieving parents that they're high achieving kids need to learn this stuff because they don't know it, but in fact, they, they do know it. Her response was, no, what's happening with the high achieving kids is their parents are sending them to science and design camps during the summer because they need a leg up to be able to get into Stanford because it's not enough just to have good grades. And so those parents are spending all this money giving them all these opportunities to learn all these different things. And I wish that would stop because I'm tired of, I want my kid to just have a life, but I got to send them to camp. And she, she went off. But it was an interesting a approach, right? She thinks the difference is actually sort of the summer experiences that the kids are having. It could also be the parents, of course. Uh, praise, praise is a good thing. I mean, you want to be loved, right? Uh, but it's important to memor remember, praise is not going to make you learn. Praise is going to make you feel good. So all the persuasive stuff, you know, uh, the uh, slot machines give you praise. Right, they give you coins and that's sort of praise and that it gets you to keep doing the slot machine. So praise is valuable, you want to keep people going but you don't want them to say this is all there is because I'm good and I only want to do where I get praised. Right, and so all the evidence is praise does not support learning but nurturing supports growth, if that helps. So the quality of negative feedback would have a big impact. Uh, The way you uh, yeah. give that negative feedback is as yeah. important as... Uh, so we, we can, so this is related to the first question, where they sort of, here, here's like a star and a wish. So you can sugarcoat it, right, and make it so that it doesn't hurt as much. Mm -hmm. But even in the feedback you give, right, so being, being told you're wrong is not great feedback, right? It's better to, to figure out, to get feedback that lets you know sort of, what should you do next? So like in little kids math games, you know, up to say age seven, we looked at them and 95% of them, if you get it wrong, it just gives you, it just says you're wrong. So we made a slight switch where if you're wrong, it shows you how far away the correct answer is from yours. Now you've got some information and so you can actually learn something. But just being told you're wrong doesn't get you very far. It just says time to change, you know, so it can be very frustrating. So there was a question, Zegmer? There was, over the back in the corner, was there one? No? Peanut gallery. students so like if you had pre-k students yeah so building with blocks or something like do you think that yeah they would... so there, there are interesting age differences in what you learn from negative and positive feedback depending on age so we've done this this poster lit thing with the negative feedback we we have done it across from the ages four to adults and it turns out adults and fourth graders choose the same amount of negative feedback on average and they learn the same amount from it so I, that was kind of a surprise. But young kids, uh, they may not know if it's negative or positive. So, okay. 
Great. Well, um, Andrew, uh, Dr. Schwartz, thanks so much. Everyone, please a round of applause. Um, thank you so much. And uh, we have a special request on Twitter from Courage Sings to see the real Zoe Chu. So here you go. Here's one last view. And a shout out to Anne Marie Cunningham, who, who's watching from the UK. She'll be here to speak later at our class. So for everyone out there, thanks so much for tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Bye. If you like what you see in this class, be sure to check out our online course, Engage and Empower Me, a new online class from the Stanford University School of Medicine. We are featuring presentations from patients and experts on participatory medicine. Through this course, we hope to empower you to take part in creating a more inclusive and collaborative healthcare system. The course can be found at class.stanford.edu. As a reminder, this program is made possible by support from the Stanford University School of Medicine, Department of Anesthesia, Stanford AIM Lab, Stanford Hospital and Clinics, and the Agency for Healthcare Research Quality. If you haven't yet done so, please take a moment to like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX so you can continue the conversation online and stay informed of program updates. From all of us here at Stanford Medicine X, we want to thank you for joining us today and remind you to join us again next Thursday, October 2nd at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for another edition of Stanford Medicine X Live featuring a new class on medical education from the Stanford University School of Medicine called Medical Education in the New Millennium. Next week, we are featuring Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine, Brian Vardabedian, and English Professor at Rice University, Kirsten Oster. For all of you out there taking time to tune in with us tonight, thank you for joining us and being part of the conversation. A special thanks to our guest panelists this evening. From all of us at Stanford Medicine X, we'll see you next time. <laughs>